All right. Hello, everybody. This is the Ask the Sensei webinar from the VO Dojo. I am Tish Hicks, the Master Sensei, and I am joined here by our wonderful Techno Sensei, Dan Leonard. Um, we are uh, very excited to start the new year off with you. Um, we had a little bit of a full start last week, so to really start it off, um, I just mentioned to some of the folks that were on uh, uh, early that uh, we've got a poll uh, up that uh, allows us to see uh, where you are in your voiceover journey so we can gauge how to answer your questions. Um, if you want to type in the chat, um, which is on the bottom menu, uh, the cartoon bubble with the ellipses in it, where you're calling from, that'd be great. Um, and uh, today, uh, being the beginning of the year, I thought we could take this time to have this be a place where everyone can articulate what their vision or what they want for 2019 is, and then um, ask or develop questions, um, questions that you have, or we can explore what questions you can be asking to get where you want to be this year. Um, and of course, if you have questions about anything else, it doesn't have to be exactly in terms of that bigger vision, but just giving a theme to start working, um, working around. Um, and uh, when you do have questions, um, uh, there is a folder at the bottom that uh, says Q&A. So a rectangle with a Q in it. And that's the place where we'll be taking questions from. Um, so let you let you guys uh, uh, take a second to formulate that as the Avengers assemble here. Um, so Dan, let me ask you a question. Um, what um, what is your how, how do you how do you approach this, and what is your um, how do you how do you approach this new year, new goal setting thing? And are you, is there anything that you're aiming for? Well, I mean, who isn't? Um, you know, I generally look at the new year as, you know, January 1st. Uh, it's just a, you know, a fiscal new quarter. And I want to be able to uh, continue all of the things that I've put in the motion in the last year or so, or the last oh, 40 years. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I do two separate, very, you know, two separate things. I'm, I'm a full-time voice actor. So I'm, you know, I'm always marketing. I'm always letting people know that I'm available. Um, I have a lot of existing clients and I try to remind them, Hey, I'm, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I continue to audition and, you know, try to find as good representation as I can, but then understand that representation means diddly unless you're making a good living yourself. Otherwise, nobody wants to represent you. Uh, nobody's going to take a chance on you. So, you know, I use what I have and try to, you know, say, hey, look, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm able to earn an income doing this. Do you think you could help me and help me make more of a living that you could also use uh, for that? Mm -hmm. uh, which is what agents are interested in, despite the fact that all these people think, got to get a good demo, got to get an agent. Doesn't work like that. It really doesn't. Uh, but, you know, I'm doing those sorts of things. And then I'm also, uh, you know, getting out there and letting people know what I do uh, as far as getting their home voiceover studios uh, up and running properly. There's mm -hmm. just so much misinformation out there. And people, a lot of people are popping up saying, oh, I'm an expert on home studios. Problem is, is most of these people are experts in one voiceover studio, and that's their own. Uh, and I've built hundreds of them, and I have to continuously remind people don't go into all these Facebook forums. Don't start talking about what's the best equipment for this and the best equipment for that. Talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. And my goal, of course, is to increase the amount of people that want to learn it right. Right, right, yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, and I, I, think, I think that it, the thing that you said about representation um, is is for the most part true, right? Repre, re, uh, people who who people who are in the business of representing you and taking a portion of the money that you make are obviously looking for um, looking for opportunities 
where people are making money so they can be making money. Um, I do think that there are some times though where you can approach somebody and they need you, like they need you. Your particular type of person, your tip, your, your, your type of voice, yeah. Thing um, to, to uh, keep yourself open always say yes until it's time to say no right and 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 then come come as prepared as you can and as professionally as you can and knowing what the game is and knowing what it takes and then presenting yourself right um so um keeping it all keeping it all positive and possible and understanding what it what what, what the what the uh what 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 uh, makes the odds for odds be in your favor? <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got some questions. Um, let's let's answer this quick tech one first uh, from Stephanie. Uh, just got a four sixteen mic for Christmas. Thanks. Mm. Anna. Um, should I use a pop filter on it? If so, which one? That's an, you know that's a really good question, and I can you do a visual aid here. <laughs> by changing microphones and, and going into my booth and showing you exactly how you don't have to have a pop filter for this sort of thing. So if you'll just hold on just one second while I change the input. Excellent. Good. Okay. And if you're just coming on, uh, let us know in the chat where, uh, where you're calling from and, uh, where you are in your right the proper way to use a 416 is like this or it, it the same rules apply for any studio condenser mic which is what a 416 is can you hear me there tish yep yep you're okay. good okay uh so you want it approximately at 30 degrees aiming towards your chest and you talk underneath it because as you can see i can say peter piper picked a peck of pickle peppers all day long you hear me as clear as a bell and you're not hearing any pops. The only reason you would use a pop filter on a 416 is if you're doing like promo work uh, and you're like really using the mic close. And you know, I have this one that's uh, made by a, a local manufacturer, hookstudios.com. He loves to play with his, uh, his, his digital printer. And the only way you, reason you would do that is if you get really close to it and you start doing this sort of thing. And that's almost nobody. So I don't use a pop filter on it because I this is the process, this is the this is the proper mic technique for using it. Mm -hmm. And as you can hear, because it's the way that the, the, the 416 is designed and why so many uh, engineers and studios really like it is that it's designed to be a video mic to pick up in a very narrow pattern. So it, it keeps out you know outside noise pretty well. It can help you out, you know, if there's a leaf blower going on outside or something. Um, but also, you know, if you're the proper distance, it sounds real like you're having a conversation, not like you're on the radio, which mm -hmm. by the way, you're not. <laughs> um, so this is, no, you really don't need a pop screen for it. Yeah. It also, and every time I show people this, that don't really need a pop screen for your, for your 416 or any mic, they realize, boy, this big black thing in front of me is really distracting and reminds me that I'm on a microphone. Therefore, I have to talk like I'm on a microphone. Interesting, yeah. So that's why I don't believe in pop screens. I think they're, for voiceover, for the way you use one of any type of any mic, you don't need a pop screen. Excellent. Good. Well, that is a, a very thorough and, and helpful answer. I, I know, um, I think you, you illuminated that for me um, as we started working together. So. And has, and has it worked for you? No, it has. It's it's brilliant and it's so much easier and so so good. Um, excellent. Well, thank you there, and hopefully that helps, Steph. Um, Lisa, this is a this is a really terrific question um, for everyone for everyone on the journey. Um, how how did you get your first break in VO? Um, I'll tell my or uh, it's it's kind of like your origin story, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, for me. Um, I uh, am from Chicago and um, studied theater at Northwestern in Chicago. So after I gra graduated, I stayed in Chicago um, and was out doing Shakespeare and worked at Second City and was, um, you know, studying opera and doing all of these different things that you do when you're a young actor um, and um, regional theater and um, um, my 
now husband's best friend, the creative director, and he called up and said, hey, uh, I have these spots for Bally's Total Fitness. I think you'd be good at. Do you want to come in and do them? And I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds cool. And um, I went and um, I did the session and it was so amazing. I left, I left that session going that that is what I'm going to do. This is it. Like everything that I'd ever done as a performer suddenly like aligned and, and I was like, oh my God. And I got paid and um, uh, I, I got to have heart lead. So, um, um, so it, 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 it became super, super clear what I was going to do after that. So that was, that was my break and my epiphany. But what, um, and this is, this is a story I always tell at the dojo. Um, I call that the helicopter coming. So um, if, you think of, if you think of the top of the mountain as a sustained successful voiceover career, a sustained successful voiceover career is the top of the mountain, the place where we're all reaching for and striving for, right? Going, aiming for, heading to, heading towards step by step, right? Um, wherever you are from sea level to summit, when the helicopter comes, get on it. Get on it, take it as far as you can and stay there as long as you can. The key is understanding that you are not an experienced mountaineer and helicopters crash, helicopters come down, helicopters drop, drop you off and pick up somebody else. So if you want to get to the top of the mountain and stay there, then when that break comes, um, a couple of things. How are you? How are you best prepared for when the break comes? Right. So it wasn't like I was sitting around eating bonbons. I had been paying for voice lessons for years. I had been working diligently in all of these different fields. It just came came across. And then, shortly after that, I moved to LA um, and uh, and arrived here, going, "That is what I'm going to do." And then this is a part I call. Um, uh, <laughs> Seek like your hair is on fire. Um, I was so, seek, seek the pond like, like your hair is on fire, right? That's, that's I think that's a Buddhist, uh, a Buddhist uh, story. But um, I just came here and I was like, this is what I want. What do you know about voiceover? Who do you know? How do I get to it? And invested time and money. And, and then that became the foundation of my you know, career that, st that became voice of Burger King and voice of HP and voice of Citibank for seven years and voice of Subaru. So it, it builds step by step like that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my origin story. How about you, Dan? Oh gosh. Um, well, this, this goes back, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, when, uh, I mean, I, I was always interested in, in theater and, and in broadcasting, um, you know, I was a I was a hockey player. Listened to a lot of hockey games on radio. We had a great radio station in Buffalo where I grew up and lived most of my life. Uh, maybe some of you on the East Coast, you know, know WKBW fifteen hundred on uh, fifteen twenty on the AM dial. Uh, and I I knew some of the jocks. My sister was involved in some of the entertainment industry, so I got to meet a lot of interesting people doing that. Uh, in high school, I was on the announcing staff, which was a lot of fun. Uh, where we would do the morning announcements. And then um, when I graduated from college and I took a, my, my, my bachelor's degree is in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a degree, you know, in broadcasting and graduated and uh, immediately got a job actually before I got my diploma at the uh, top station in town, but it wasn't like a big rock station. It was an easy listening station. Joy FM 96. Uh, but it was a big station. And, you know, from there I was able to, you know, be on the radio. Uh, then I met somebody who, uh, who I told, I, you know, she's actually now here in LA. Uh, she's an established uh, comedian and, uh, uh, and voiceover person here in LA now. Haven't run into her since then, but uh, she helped me. Uh, I, I told her I was interested in doing voiceover, and she she worked with advertising agencies and was a producer. And she dragged me into a studio that I you know that I was familiar with uh, in Buffalo, and uh, we were doing commercials for a local TV station. And uh, that was my first exposure to doing you know session work in in a studio. 
And, uh, and then I went on to a career in broadcasting where I was, you know, on the air, became a production director. I produced thousands of commercials for various different radio stations. Uh, left broadcasting in 1992, uh, went back to school, got my, well, actually, I, I sold life insurance for a while, which is another story. Uh, which is, by the way, great training for learning how to do uh, marketing and, you know, cold calling. You your know. own sales, sales for yourself. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I learned how much I hated it, but, you know, but you learn how to do it. And you learn things like, as you were saying earlier, every no is one no closer to a yes. So you got to keep pushing for that. Uh, and then um, I went back to school, got my teaching degree, taught American history in high schools for a couple of years, decided it was not for me, even though I loved teaching, uh, did not like the administrations. But again, that's another story. And, uh, and I came home, was a stay at home dad and, uh, I had to finish my master's degree and while finishing my master's degree, I, my, I was assigned a project by the chairman of the history department at Buffalo state college, who had also been the history, the chairman of the history department when I was there you know, 12 years earlier, 15 years earlier. And, uh, he gave me a project that required you know, it was a video project, and I realized that if I could just turn it into an audio project, it would make a great radio documentary, which I did. And uh, it's available on YouTube. It was about this this jazz pianist in Buffalo who actually was apparently the founder of bebop. It was a fascinating story. Uh, but I realized then, I'm like, well, wait a second. If I can record digitally and do stuff in my basement, shouldn't I be able to do this at home? And, you know, typed in voiceover and those early search engines and uh, suddenly voiceover was there and uh, I was able to ride the early rave wave of, of voiceover on the Internet uh, before it was a very closed society of, of a few jocks that might have a recording studio or were doing stuff on the side out of their own radio studios where they were working. And now anybody could do it. And the technology was there. And uh, so I was able to start building my business off of pay-to-plays, off of forward marketing, uh, that sort of thing. And that was in 2004. Yeah. So I've been doing it for you know, almost 15 years now for, uh, for, as a freelance voice actor. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. There's a lot, of, lot of things, a lot of things in your origin story, Dan, that I think are, are really important for everyone to know. And I love, I love this idea. Um, uh, wherever you are, you know, if, if however far you are on the journey, it looks like everyone's in in pretty good, you know, pretty good fun. Remember, tell tell the story of your origin story, right? If you're just starting out, realize you're creating your origin story. Um, the thing, the things that strike me, Dan, um, about your story is um, uh, coming from broadcast um, at the dojo. I I always. Um, uh, I I say that broadcast is kind of like the cousin of voiceover, that all of the skills that you have as in broadcast are going to be applicable. Um, and it's just a little bit way, the family runs a little bit different. Like if you went over to your cousin's house to sleep over when your parents went out of town, you know you're in family and it's comfortable, but the rules are a little bit different or how things run are a little oh, yeah. different. So it's really adjusting. And then the other thing that is really fascinating um, about your origin story, Dan, is that all the other, well, all the other things that you've done have served you. You're an educator that has served you. You had sales background in something completely unrelated, but that serves you. So there's always, whatever your journey to here has been, there's always a way that we can take that expertise and adjust it to this medium. It will apply. And the third thing that I note from yours is that every juncture, you use the word decide. I decided, I decided, I decided, right? So I think, I think that's really the key to everyone's origin story. Well, you got to, you got to commit to stuff. I mean, if you, if you, if you want to do something and you feel it's your passion to do it, um, you go for it. Um, if you feel comfortable doing it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's always hard work, but if you're comfortable, if you feel familiar in that particular realm, go for it, you know, yeah. and that's why, that's why you're all here this morning. Yeah. Well, good, good, good. Thank you. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, and, um, 
Uh, yeah, and I would love to hear from everybody. Um, um, I would like to hear from everybody, hear a little bit from you about what's on your mind for the new year. What are you after this year? And uh, where? what questions do you have about how you can get it? Like, what, what, where Where do you like, ah, I see it, but I don't, I'm not sure how to get it. I'd love to hear, just, uh, just to share your goals too, if you want to put those in the chat, that would be a great discussion. Um, yeah, uh, hope, okay, so uh, Duran, um, hopefully I'm saying your name right, um, says, I current, I'm currently off the pay to play sites, but wondering how I can best audition for e-learning jobs, where to look, et cetera. Thinking of doing a marketing campaign locally, but wondering if you have any suggestions. Um, a couple, couple things. I think that, uh, taking, taking the, taking the, you know, the, the closest radius, um, is, is a great approach right? Because the other, the other thing about both my and Dan's origin stories, if you'll notice, is relationship. Relationship, relationship, relationship. Um, you know, one of our taglines for um, the Via Dojo Pro Fight Club, which is our working pro workout that um, we bring top-notch talent together with the decision makers at IRS, one of the taglines that I have for it is, yeah, it's who you know. And not like that keeps you out. It's really an invitation in. So how do you get to know? How do you get to know people? So um, locally is a great place to start, and then expanding, um, and and building building relationships and thinking how you can serve. Right now, um, I also am a big proponent of cutting to the chase. Um, so finding the people who like do this all the time and know what they're doing. Um, uh, not, I think it was last, no, two months ago, we had um, Christy Bowen on uh, as, a, as a, one of our colleagues for Ask the Sensei. And she has just released the e-learning series that she is promoting. Um, and uh, like, she'd be the first person that I would talk to about that. Um, so, um, other, you know, and, and within that e-learning course and, and some of the things that she talked about uh, last time was with, with any of these, with any of these, um, any genre that you're approaching, who's making it, right? Who, who needs what work? So right. who needs e-learning? So um, like start, it's not only like who is it, it's how do you start thinking about it and how do you start thinking of yourself as part of the solution? So like laying that down, um, I'll just put that out generally. Um, Dan, I know you do a lot of e-learning work yourself. And as an educator, I think that's, you probably have so much uh, leg up in that. Well, it, it doesn't hurt. Um, you know, there's, uh, I mean, I did two e-learning things this morning before this, uh, working with uh, existing clients. Uh, I built my e-learning business essentially off pay to plays and uh, a, a couple of rosters where I was put into, um, uh, you know, I, I was I was put into a job. Once you get a job with one of these clients, you establish the fact that you're the guy that should do it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my biggest clients is a a, a large distributorship uh, in Houston of of a commodity that uh, that you know a lot of construction people need, and you wouldn't believe how many of these things they sell and how many companies they represent. But because I've done all of their training, uh, they can't get rid of me. I know their product line better than they do. Uh, and I know an awful lot about what it is that, you know, how to, how to install the products that they represent, uh, which is actually kind of a cool knowledge thing. Um, also, it, it, it was a matter of doing a little bit of cold calling. Uh, and again, it's about finding a client and making that or finding somebody who needs your voice and making them a client. Uh, you know, when you meet people, we were talking about socializing, when you get someone's business card or uh, you meet somebody at a party or something and you go, oh, you work for so-and-so company. Do you guys do any training for your employees or stuff to inform your customers? Yeah, I think we do that. Well, and I used to say, who's the guy? And now I've just learned to say, who's the person uh, <laughs> that, uh, who's the person that does that? Can I have their name? Can I use your name? And talk to them and say, look, I'm a voice actor. 
I do this sorts of, I sort this sort of thing. Do you need someone who can record this stuff professionally mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and make it easy for you, which is the other key to e-learning, which is make it easy for the person on the other end, make their job easy um, by giving them something that they don't have to fuss with too much. It's like, here, here's your file. It goes into your PowerPoint. It goes into your video, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and that's really where, where e-learning comes from. And there's a tremendous amount of it. Every company, any, any large business or medium to large business has to do video, has to do training stuff. And they're all going to internet based stuff. And that's where, that's really where the business is. And I think the majority of people who are making a living in voiceover, uh, I mean, we all want to be in commercials and we all want to be big stars, which is not what voiceover is about. Voiceover is about being a, it's a job. You got to work at it. And so therefore you've got to find lots of different opportunities to do what you do aside from commercials and e-learning is probably the largest segment of that. Uh, that's where the business is. The people who are actually making a living doing voiceover are very good at marketing to the people that create e-learning material. And that can be e-learning companies. It can be the companies themselves. Uh, the, the opportunities lie in, you know, in, in, far, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, God, there's just so much of that stuff. Uh, you know, I work, I have a couple of clients that are, you know, it's all, it's training drug reps how to not break the rules. Uh, a lot of stuff in compliance, uh, in banking compliance, in, it's just, you really learn what, what goes on in the economy and, and, you know, having come out of the insurance business, you know, it was something I understood. So with financial stuff and things along those lines, it's just a natural for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I just did something about acoustical doors and acoustical panels for a company I work with. And I'm like, oh, here's something I know an awful lot about. <laughs> um, you know, and so you look for stuff that you're familiar with, stuff that you can explain and make it sound like you actually know what you're talking about. Well, that, that's an interesting, where do you match? Oh, again, this is where your expertise comes in. And I think, I think also the way I look at it, the way I look at it is that narration and e-learning being a segment of narration is sort of the, a, a place that has the, the lowest, uh, or, or a, a fair, it's fairly accessible. It's something that you can go after yourself, right? And build your own client list. And, um, and there's a lot of it, as Jan said, everybody needs it. So it's a great foundation. And then everybody's going to be deciding, you know, wh- what market are you in? What is available? What are you, what are your dreams, right? Because, um, you, to have some bread and butter stuff like being able to do e-learning is fantastic and you you can also you know I, I think everyone needs to diversify so understanding that it is a very powerful possible um revenue stream and then you defining what your time your time ratio is and where you where your interests lie um too is is very good um there's um <coughs> I think, I think the other thing, um, Duran, that is interesting, uh, you know, particularly in light of some of the recent developments in the pay-to-play world, um, sort of like pay-to-play is, has been a new answer, and now it seems uh, it seems like as everyone's flocked there, it's also becoming more problematic, or people are, are realizing, eh, is this is this really best way to do this? So there's also an I like I like that you're that you're kind of switching, switching perspective and seeing what you can take responsibility, responsibility for yourself. And I always think of it like if you're at a dance and there's a group of like a whole group of, you know, say, say you're a girl, you know, like there's a whole group of guys and you could, you know, or, or alternatively a whole group of girls. If you're in with a mix of girls, how do you become the one that is like, hey, I'm going to dance with you, right? So I, I think pay to play is often like that. Um, so lo- lots of lots of other discussion about this, um, but hopefully that is helpful. Um, let's see, let's see where we're at time. Oh, so I'd love to. We're getting some really um, great shares of um, of things of, of of stuff that you're working on, and we'll come back to some questions. Um, Catherine, hey Catherine Campion, how are you, dear? Um, 
Catherine is an old oh, friend of mine and a rock star in this business. Um, and, um, you know, what I love about this call is that we all always have questions, no matter how, how much we've done and how, how, uh, how long we've been doing it. Um, so Catherine says, totally relaunching connections with buyers, working with Randy Thomas, going with, like I said, go with the people who, who inspire you and, and can, can take you to the place. And that's going to be different for everybody, right? What you need next and, and who you need next and what's the next thing is, is going to be different. Um, and there's something else. Um, focusing on where the least effort generates the greatest returns um, is, is once again, how everyone customizes. Um, yeah, um, so this is great. And you have to determine where your hustle is. I love that. Um, Catherine, what, what questions are you, do you have um, in terms of these, um, in terms of these um, relaunching connections and, and buyers? Um, uh, let, let us know if you have anything, um, any, any specific questions that, that we can put out. Um, and feel free to, you know, to chime in. Um, um, Joni says, my goal this year is to absolutely free myself from the P2P dungeon. It's, it's, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> marketing priority, building a clientele, and also try to approach local businesses. Um, and, um, and Joni, I know from discussions that we have, you have like superhero powers from uh, a, your, your, previous, <laughs> your previous life in terms of um, relationships with advertising and stuff and, and place with advertising world. Um, so I think that also is some place that you can cut to the chase there. Um, cause if you know, if, if you know the creative director, why don't you just say, Hey, I'd like to work with you. <laughs> and then they'd call you and they wouldn't have to go to the p to b So, um, cutting to the chase there. Um, but let us know what, what questions you have too. Uh, yeah, good. Oh, and, and your question is, had had to had a major demo. So that, that's in process, yeah? Or is that your question down here? Yeah, she's got that question down there. What, we all need good demos. What's the etiquette for getting different genres done by different demo producers? Yeah. Fascinating question, mm -hmm. especially today. I can tackle that one. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, demos are important. Um, there are some very good demo producers, and then there are some companies that are just demo mills. They're like, they don't train you. They don't, uh, they're like, okay, yeah, I'll just get in the studio. Let's record something and, and send something out. Um, first off, you don't do a demo until you're ready to do a demo in a particular genre. You've got to have the talent. You've got to have the goods. Uh, second, you've got to, you know, if you do a demo, you have to be able to do stuff that you know that can be reproduced at any other time. Uh, just because someone might be a great coach or a great uh, director or something like that, and they're good at directing you, you know, they're not going to be in the booth with you when you're working with somebody else. And the, and the client says, yeah, I love that thing on your demo. Can you do it the way you did this? And, you know, the copy is different. It's a totally different subject. You may not be able to do that. So you've got to be you've got to be ready. And the person that produces your demo, someone like Tish, who, you know, helps you with this kind of stuff, she's going to tell you. And she'll probably agree with me. Unless you're ready to do it, don't do it. I mean, yeah, you want to try and get, you know, you can, you can, you know, cobble some stuff together. Uh, but it, you know, right now, I think it's more important to get your auditioning down really good. And once you start doing a lot of auditions and you get really even better at doing that, then, you know, then you can start firing off stuff for a professional demo. And, you know, it doesn't have to be really sophisticated. There's lots of different opinions on, you know, who to work with, how to get it done. But just like with home voiceover studios, Every voice is different. Every room is different. Everything is unique. The most important thing about a demo is what is it unique that you bring to the table? Right. And somebody yeah. has to recognize that and, and bring that out in you in your demo. Right, right, right. And I think, I think that, that gets to the what is the etiquette for getting. So, so, so that, is, that is great advice for, for demos 
in in specifically you know at, at dojo we we have rubrics right there's like there's um things that we're looking for <laughs> that was, and one of the that, that that say when you're ready right so one of the things that i looked for are are you able to are you able to pick up any piece of copy that's put in front of you and nail a great take within one or two takes that would be a great first starting place um so and then it seems like Joni, your question is about different genres and different people so i think it's a two-layer question here um so first first the 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 well several layers here because dan's addressing what is a good demo and how how do you know that um and then different genres are you uh, where where are you in being able to deliver competitively with that genre right and then in terms of different demo producers um you know i think this i think this goes to this goes to um a mindset, which is also you know, at the heart of everything we do at the dojo, what's your mindset about this? I think that as actors and performers, a lot of time we get into this mindset that we are not in control of things. You know, there's, there's the word submit your audition, which I hate. It's like, oh, I submit, I submit my audition. And it just puts us in this like, we can't do anything. Actually, we're business owners, and we make it, we make informed, wise decisions um, based on our instincts and what we are trying to accomplish. So, in terms of like an etiquette, um, you know, in terms of an etiquette, there's a, a someone who's a demo producer is someone who is someone that you are buying services from <laughs> so you are in you are in control so if you would like to have one demo done by someone else and someone else do the other you know i i would i would investigate who knows that who knows that um genre really well and then the second layer is who do you resonate with right um and um so so that's um going with different people and you know if you if you have a demo session where you're not you didn't get what you want um it's i, I would say you know you were totally within your rights to say wow I, that wasn't what i wanted and go with somebody else you know what i mean um so yeah i think i think it's it's, a, it's about taking a perspective of you're in the driver's seat what de what demos do you want to do how many different different demos do you want and how do you need them because that's going to be different for everybody right we just did a you should do voiceover intensive and there's a amazing woman who has has just a little voice that's just kind of like this all the time it's like well clearly one of the things that you're going to do first is an animation demo right which is different than somebody else's voice um let's see hopefully that's that's helpful I think etiquette etiquette is just being respectful and dealing with people in good business ways. There's it's right. not it's not an emotional thing. It's right. a, and and see how professional they are with you. Uh, you know, I mean, you're you're like you said, you're you're in the driver's seat here. Um, you know, a good a a good strategy might be see who's doing the big guys demos, and talk to those people. Would you do my demo? And they're only going to work with people they know they'll be successful with because that's why they do successful demos for people. Mm -hmm. And if they think you're ready, they're not just going to take your money. They've got a reputation to, uh, uh, to uphold. So if they think you're ready, that's, that's another good key into uh, somebody that uh, you might want to do business with, but they ain't cheap. But if you're investing your career, that's what it takes to, you know, to have a, a, a good piece of your, your business uh, puzzle. Yeah. And, you know, um, you're continuing uh, just to do your, your follow up journey. Um, you're getting a demo done with a highly visible demo producer. That's great. If you don't want them to do your e-learning, then don't put that on the table. You know, yeah. sometimes, sometimes if you're working with a demo producer and you're doing a whole package or suite of things, it's like when you buy appliances together, you, you might be able to work something out with them. But you, you can go buy your microwave and your dishwasher and your stove separately, too. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. 
we can segue. Oh, let's let's do follow up from Catherine and um, uh, with a question about voice Sam. You, you oh yeah, voice Sam. Uh, yeah, she, the, the the question is, is, you know, she says wondering at your take on voice Sam, and my question is about finding an updated bio list and stuff. Voice Sam is, you know, if you're not familiar with it, Voice Sam, is a a program that uh, uh, that connects to your website and hosts your demos and allows you to break them up into individual files uh, to, um, you know, so if a client is like going through your demos, I don't want to hear this one, they can just jump right ahead and listen to those certain things. It also gives you lots of, uh, uh, lots of data on who's listening, how long they've listened, what they've listened to, and get an idea of what work, what's working and what's not. What is it that people want to listen to, especially with your stuff? And, um, you know, it's an interesting thing to add on. It's, you know, it's another thing you can add onto your, onto your website that just adds to the sophistication of it. If you're sophisticated enough to do that and you're committed to doing it, it's, it's an interesting way to do things. There are other ways to do it as well. Um, it's just one thing. And, you know, like with any technology, I tend to think that it's not the technology that gets you work. It's your ability to look at copy and make it sound like you're not reading it. Uh, and, and therefore all of this other stuff is some so, somewhat ancillary. If you think it's something that will help you with your marketing and understanding who your market is and how you do what you do, you know, you know, give a free trial on it. See if it's, if it works for you. And I think, I think for me, um, going back to the question is of how we are serving our clients, right? How can we best serve the people who need our voices to get what they need done? Um, voice exam seems like something that can be a way to give somebody a quicker way to get exactly what they need, right? In the same way that we have different genre demos. So if I'm looking for an e-learning, I'm not going to listen to your animation because I don't, it, it doesn't apply to what I'm trying, the problem I'm trying to solve right now. Um, it could also be just a way for someone to be able to get to exactly what they need in your voice um, quickly. So that's one way of looking at it, how it could be helpful. Um, the other thing is to set up a voice, a voice fam, you need to be really super clear on articulating what this piece is doing, um, what, what this piece of copy is doing and representing in what you can do, which can help with all of your marketing and articulating what it is you do to yourself and to others. So, um, you know, I would say if, if you're doing re, total revamping, um, you know, or, or if you have clients who, who you work with or, or people who are in that decision-making process, you know, ask them, do you find this useful? Is it, is it, is it overkill? Is it something that people used to be doing or aren't doing as much anymore? Um, yeah. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's helpful. Definitely worth exploring. And I think it's, it's, uh, it is an investment though, right? There's a monthly, monthly maintenance sort of fee on a, on a voice sound thing to have it ongoing. Is that right, Dan? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then she asks about CRM software, which, you know, if, you know, I think if you're a good business person, you want to have, you know, these types of systems that can help you track your business, who your clients are, what they're asking of you, how to schedule things, and a good CRM program will do that. And there's plenty out there, uh, but there are a couple that are designed specifically for voiceover, uh, you know, that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. Um so, you know, do it, you know, do your homework, see what work, you know, take a look at them. They usually offer you a free demo and see what works for your particular workflow. You don't just buy something and say, well, let's see if I can make this work for me. See if it works for you to start with. Yeah. Um, I know Danny, uh, Danny States has also been a Ask the Sensei um, colleague on here, and she has a, a product called Voice Overview that is, um, I don't know if it's fully a CRM, um, but it, it keeps track of all of your jobs and thereby the people you've done the jobs with. Um, but I, and, and it also um, is very good at keeping track of your, the money aspect of, of like really running a business and keeping your financials in order and the clients being where the, 
where the financials come from the relationships with the clients. Um, I would suggest looking at that. Um, I know a lot of people use Nimble as, a, as a, something to look into. Um, yeah, if anyone has any other thoughts on what they use, that's a good, good thing. Um, let's see, what other questions do we well, have? Dur Duran has a good, interesting question about, you know, my space here. Uh, and not my space, but my specific space here. Oh. <laughs> um, what was that? My yeah, space. Just, uh, uh, Duran, glad to see your recording booth, Dan. Is that a folding screen you have behind you in the standing booth? I'm still trying. I'm trying to refresh and update my voiceover space and experimenting with what I have behind me, either an acoustic blanket or a screen instead of the bookcase I currently have, etc. It appears you have a separate space for seated long form narrations. Well, not necessarily. I mean, what you haven't been in here lately, Tish, but I, I totally redid oh, everything I in here. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, I mean, well, here, I can show you. I mean, in, if you remember, I used to have a horrendously messy desk in this corner. <laughs> now, now it's a couch. Wow, yes. So, you know, better seating for our show and, uh, you know, and a beer tap. Not that I drank a lot of beer, but <laughs> gift from Mr. Widom. Um, and um, so it's a professional recording space. The booth... Uh, was part of our show, Voiceover Body Shop. It's where, where George and I would sit as you know the hosts of the show. But we decided to move that all out into this area here, which is now just a green screen area. And, uh, and we do everything from, uh, from there, which freed up my booth to become a, really become a booth again, which allowed me to put up this tropical paradise uh, uh, tapestry that we had originally bought. And then this all became, uh, this is all storage area behind here. Uh, the, the, the screen was something my wife had. We found a better folding screen at a, at a thrift store here in Van Nuys uh, that was just gorgeous. And she's like, hey, you want my screen? And I'm like, yeah. And it hides the shelf that I put in there for more storage. Uh, and the booth already sounded really good. The screen really is more of a cosmetic thing. It really doesn't affect the acoustics in there at all. Uh, but, you know, if you're trying to reduce the acoustical size of your space, a folding screen like that is great. And you throw a moving blanket over that. And that really does help uh, eliminate uh, echoes in a larger room, which is what you're trying to do. Uh, that's not a large room. It's more cosmetic than anything else. So don't take that as, oh, Dan has a screen in his, in his booth. You got to put one of those up. If you're in a larger room, it can help, like I said, reduce the acoustical size of the space that you're recording in. So, uh, you know, there's a quick tour. Oh, and I also have lights that change color. Oh. <laughs> this, this is this is what I was doing during the holidays, was just totally right. revamping this and making the studio look a little bit more professional. Think I think there's, there's a couple things that Dan just said about, you know, space clearing in general, a good thing, <laughs> taking things out that aren't working and allowing the new to come in. Um, and then I think there's something also about finding the balance between the functional, right? Yes, we just need it to sound good. But then also creating, you know, one of the things we talk about at the dojo here is, is that when you step up to the mic, um, I look at it as, 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 you know, stepping into your sacred yes space, like creating your Zen bubble and, and creating this space where you're coming to create every day. Mm -hmm. So if there is something like, you know, having a, a, a happy floral um, pattern on the thing that's keeping sound and it makes a pleasant, a pleasant experience to be in, I think that that's, that's something in addition to care, ultimately it just needs to sound good. But how are you creating this space that is your workshop to create every day and someplace that is your special place to, to go to? Um, and it's not, a, and again, it's not about how it looks, it's about how it sounds. And it's not about, it's not about having the technical, it's about having the reads, but it, I think it all, it all goes together. Um, I know in, in my uh, home, home booth closet, um, I have some old draperies um, like really thick, lovely, um, sort of from someone's someone's old house uh, where they had big thick draperies that have beautiful floral pattern, and it's it's a nice thing separating. So um, let's see how we're we doing. We've got about a few more minutes. Um, let's see. Um, There's a question here from Emily Rose about what should a good character reel and commercial demo reel have. That's a good question and, and kind of kind of riffs off of the general thing that we were talking about. 
Um, what's your nutshell on that, Dan? Uh, having, well, and, and my commercial or my, my animation demo or character demo, fortunately I had some great people to work with here in LA. You know, if you're living in Des Moines or, you know, various other places, it's kind of hard to find these people. Um, but you know, I worked with Debbie Derryberry and she, you know, she's just amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, if she thinks you're good enough, she'll work with you. And, mm -hmm. and that's really, you have to find somebody who's been good at doing uh, character demos, uh, people who work. I think makes a good one. Uh, what makes a good one? I mean, what makes a good one is a total variety of characters, uh, showing what, you know, your versatility, your ability to stretch and, you know, change from an old man to a lively old man. And, you know, th those sorts of things. You, doing characters is a whole different technical skill. Uh, and what's important is that a coach who works with you doesn't create you in their image, someone who perhaps was successful in this business. They're creating you in your image. What is it, again, what's unique about you? What is it that you bring to the table? I think you can probably do this type of a character. Try this, try that, and see how well you can, you can adjust to doing those, those different types of characters and teach you what, it, what goes into the process of creating characters. It's not just being able to do funny voices. Uh, it's the ability to really understand different parts of your, of, you know, of, of your, your entire vocal apparatus and where things come from. And uh, it's, it's, a whole, it's a whole theory and study. And uh, if you're willing to do that, it, you know, it, you know it, it's, great, it's great work if you can get it. There's a lot of people trying to get into it, but if with, with uh, you know, the internet and with uh, so much stuff, you know, with animation and, and video games more than anything else, cripes, you know, that's, it's a good time to have a, a character demo, especially one where you can show off the types of stuff that you need to do for, for video games. Well, and I think, I think, yes, and, and, and for me, there's a couple criteria. One, any reel is a showcase of the range of things that you can do. Right. And it doesn't mean you have to be able to do high and low and all, you know, you, just a range of what you are capable. So even if it's just, if you do one color, then show me all the shades of blue that you do. If you can do all sorts of different colors, then let me get a sense of that, right? Um, what Dan was saying, it's not about voices, it's about uh, the heart of the character, understanding what it's after. So I think there's a couple, couple of things that you're looking for in a good character demo. Um, you want to um, have, uh, and then one other thing um, uh, that is important to take into account is the range of, of animation work that there is these days, right? There's, there's from, you know, My Little Pony to Archer, right? Um, or, or even beyond Archer, like even more Adult Swim, right? So you need to understand what I call the tone of the tune and show a range of how your voice can apply in what the market needs, um, what your voice can do in terms of range of, of sound and tone and qualities and textures, and then wh what is your range of emotional life and pacing. Um, I think a good character reel should have you um, really embodying being able to create a scene and urgency and physicality through your vocal um, thing. So it has um, as, as much as we can get in, a, in, in one minute um, is, is the real thing. And then on, on a commercial reel, kind of similar. How does your voice serve the market? Um, it, what is, um, we want a, a, a range of what I call the cello meter of a range of intimacy and energy, right? That would apply to any, any ad that would be on TV. So what's, what's your quiet, intimate, most intimate place? And a spot that's, that's sort of right here and maybe, maybe has a different pacing. And then the really high retail one, you know, it's the Toyota red day. It's a Toyota one day only sale. Come on down and da 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 da. Right. And even bigger than that. So having a range of, of, energies and then what your voice is and then um the way we work here is how is it a personal reflection of you is is what's on your demo something that really resonates with you because if you're in line with what really resonates with you then chances are it'll probably really resonate with me um so those are those are things that uh 
that I look for um, in a good commercial. And also, here's another great thing for either and for any reel. Does it take you on a ride? Like, does it make, does it start you somewhere, take you on a ride, go all, all these twists and turns and make you, and come to a conclusion? And ideally, um, on that ride, whoever's listening gets to know you, didn't want to get off at any point, and when it comes to the end, goes like, ooh, I want to do that again. Who was that? That's great. So that's, you know, that's another thing of, is, is, it, is it a good ride? <laughs> um, yeah, well, um, let's see. This is very, very good. We're coming to coming to the end of the ride here. Um, really good questions, guys. Um, always know that um, you know, if you didn't get your question answered, if something comes up um, otherwise, you can always reach um, reach me for a I call it a voiceover once over call, free fifteen minute call. Um, you can go to our website www.thevodojo.com um and find that but always always available if you have questions um let's see dan how do people reach you and, I, and then i want to share with people um what's coming up at, at, at the dojo as well sure um you can reach me uh i you know i've got a couple of websites uh for the different things i do but if you're interested in some help with your home voiceover studio uh, you can go to homevoiceoverstudio.com. Yeah, I got that URL. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, contact me. I can do consults with you. My most important point is that, you know, you don't want to obsess about the technology because it's not about the equipment. And what I'll do is I will teach you the basics of what it takes to do voiceover. So all you have to do is hit record and do what you do. And not think about, oh, I got to process this. I got to do this. I got to get this microphone. You know, I, I will, you will leave after an hour, hour and a half with a huge boulder lifted off of your head. <laughs> so that's uh, homestudio.com. Home voiceoverstudio.com. Home voiceoverstudio.com. Excellent. Good, good, good. And um, in terms of uh, stuff that's going on here, um, we do this the first Wednesday of every month at 10 o'clock. Dan and I are here, and then we usually have another um, colleague uh, that joins us. So there's lots of different angles and facets to uh, getting, getting your questions answered, because that's always the case. Um, if you're starting your journey or midway and need like something that might be another way of thinking it, um, we are starting our You Should Do VoiceOver Virtual Intensive this Saturday. We have some spots left. Or if you know somebody, if, <laughs> if you're a working pro and have people, um, people saying, hey, can I take you to coffee and pick your brain? You can just go like, hey, you know what would be good? You can get all the answers there. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a service we do for our <laughs> working pro colleagues too. Um, uh, let's see what else. If you are a working pro um, and need a place to rejuvenate or refocus or get some of these things, uh, get some support and accountability around these things that you've set out as goals, um, we have the nth degree, which is a weekly virtual workout that includes a virtual fight club. Well, actually, wherever you are, includes a, a fight club. And um, uh, you can start that at the beginning of any month um really powerful focus and accountability because it's it's always just you but you never do it alone and um it's hard um and then the last thing is uh the bo dojo pro fight club is starting up uh uh we've got a virtual coming up in uh january 29th and then we're going to have our first um our first new york live fight club in february so keep your eyes open for that um yeah, Carly Silver is going to be the, the guest there in New York. So um, check out the website, www.thevodojo.com. Thank you all for being here. Um, look forward to seeing you next month. And always here to help with whatever you need. So, thanks so much, Dan. I know you're super busy. So really appreciate yep. taking the time out for Thank you, Tish. Thanks, everybody, for coming. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day. <laughs>